In our world, you end up going bankrupt. In the government world, they just keep writing checks. Hi, I'm Ted Balaker with Reason TV, and today I'll be speaking with Ray Griggs. Griggs is the director of the new documentary, I Want Your Money, which hits theaters October 15th. Ray, tell me about your film. I created a documentary about two views you can take, capitalism versus socialism. Taking two iconic presidents, Ronald Reagan and Obama, and contrasting these two views. When a viewer goes to see your film, what can he or she expect? Who do you interview? What kind of stories do you tell? I did get notable interviewees of people that you recognize that have real good knowledge about what they're talking about and you can back it up and say, you know what, that's right. People like Mike Huckabee, Newt Gingrich, John Stossel. When an audience member comes out, what do you hope he or she remembers? I hope they get away with a new understanding and definition of capitalism and the beauty of our country and realizing the massive debt that we're accumulating. In concrete terms, what might happen if we don't right this ship? It's beyond what you can think of as bankruptcy. Uh, that's the beauty in our world is, is you're only allowed so much money uh, and then you end up going bankrupt. In the government world, they just keep writing checks that we can't sustain. We have to ultimately be responsible for it. You're talking about $13 trillion of debt. In the brief conversation we just started talking about right now, we've already spent $2 million. I mean, it's literally going every 60 seconds, $2.5 million. We have to be held accountable for that. A collapse of our country or whether it's just losing all the freedoms that we have today that you know of as, as uh, the free market and capitalism will allow or whether it's just uh, completely high, insane taxes. You just can't afford to better your lifestyle or do anything you want to do in life because you're, you're breaking your back every day just to try to pay your taxes alone. It's an interesting topic because on the one hand, you do have a lot of folks who are upset about it, but on the other, it's sort of ephemeral to a lot of people like, so the debt is growing, but it's been growing for a long time. Yeah, those are the people not paying taxes. <laughs> people who don't pay into taxes, uh, they want more and more and more. As long as it benefits them, sure they're going to vote for it. The problem is debt. What's your solution? One is we got to get to a balanced budget. The other is we got to control spending. As sad as it sounds, we've got to eliminate some of these entitlement programs. Uh, as you know, Reagan has said it best, these entitlement programs is the closest thing you'll ever experience to um, eternity because they don't end. You have a write-up in the New York Times. You're going to be opening in 500 theaters. All these things are very unusual for a documentary filmmaker not named Michael Moore. <laughs> yeah. So how did you do it uh, uh, with this very different message? That's a tough one to answer. I'd say, you know, obviously God is, uh, I believe in God and he's, I feel he's in my corner, but I feel I created something reaching out to the people and uh, they're just happening to be talking about it because it's on their minds. I think timing has something to do with it a little bit. Timing is especially interesting in this case. It opens October 15th, a couple weeks before the midterm elections. That was a struggle because, you know, I had just finished the documentary and, and I was trying to get it out before the midterm elections because it's very timed. It's, it's concerning the midterm elections. You know, I want people to go in and take back the House. I wonder if you have any worries about the FEC. In 2008, there was the very famous case of Hillary the movie that was halted on the grounds that it was coming out right before the Democratic primaries. Since then, we've had the Citizens United decision, which was a victory for free speech, uh, although highly controversial to a lot of people. Where does that leave you in your film? I like to play chess. So in my life, I, I like to, to think like chess and always think ahead. I've already uh, applied to the FEC about getting approval and shown previous cases of how uh, Hillary was eventually approved and Fahrenheit 9-11 was approved. Nothing in our film is pushing one certain candidate or looking at trying to endorse some political event. We're merely speaking the fact about debt. If the story is about debt, then there's plenty of blame to go around. Exactly. In, in terms of Democrat right. and Republican. Oh, exactly, because I don't even let Bush off the hook. He drove that debt up like crazy. He did lower taxes, but again, he spent like a drunken sailor. <laughs> After the midterm elections, uh, everybody's assuming the Republicans are going to gain a lot of ground. What's to prevent them from just falling into the same bad habits that they did before? I would like to think that a lot of Republicans today that are running are paying attention to what's going on and, and realizing what the people are speaking, like the Tea Parties and all these other people are speaking out about, and say, you know what, I need to get back to the old traditional conservative values, okay, and control spending. And so I'd like to believe that the ones that are running now today are taking a lot of this in consideration and, and are going to make a change. Most documentaries tend toward the liberal direction. You're a conservative filmmaker. Did you have any problems with that in the development of your film? It wasn't as easy getting crew together as you think. You had to find like-minded people 
just to run your camera or, or run your sound equipment. They'd want to know about the documentary and you tell them about it and then they're like, hmm, I'll tell you what, um, if I'll work on it as long as my name isn't attached to it because I'm not going to ruin my career. Believe it or not, I actually really got responses like that. You got all these battles when you're taking on a conservative documentary. I think that can change um, if more and more people get behind it. I think there should be just as equal conservative documentaries as there is liberals. Uh, Michael Moore, I mean, the man's a genius. He's capitalized on the left. The man made $220 million off Fahrenheit 9-11. You can't deny his success of the way he pulls his documentary films in. A lot of people have their problems with Michael Moore. I would, <laughs> you know, I certainly have mine with, with how he makes his films, but I, I guess what you're saying, and it seems to be a, a good point, at least can we credit him with maybe getting people used to and comfortable with the documentary form? Whether you like Michael Moore or you don't, you have to give him credit for being a filmmaker and being able to entertain the audience and, and bring in those dollars. I'm going to shift to a couple of your other projects. I hear that you developed an iPhone app that was not, shall we say, embraced by Apple? Right. You turn it on, it senses your GPS location, and within seconds it'll tell you who your congressman is and give you their phone number and their email address. And then if you didn't like your bill that they voted on or whatever, you shake your phone and their head bobbles. They rejected it due to the caricature of it. Did they say why? Was it uh not respectful of their high office? <laughs> they had a character, Nancy Pelosi, and they came back and said, you know, we just don't approve of this. Because of the news and the attention and everything it got, they end up, you know, looking at it and rescinding it and, and put it back on Apple. What's it called if people It's want? called Bobble Rep. If you go to the website of I Want Your Money, you'll see a link that goes right to it and you can download it. Tell me about your Wind in the Willows uh, project. project. It was a famous story back in 1908 by Kenneth Graham. What I wanted to do in Wind in the Willows is I wanted to go back, again, old school, and take what's called animatronics. It's not CG animation, it's not claymation, it's not cartoon animation. It's basically robots, if you think of it that way, puppeteered robots. And I want to take future technology and bring that up to speed and, and create new innovative ways to explore those type of creatures. In our test, for example, Mole, he has over 58 servos inside the head. These are gears and motors that make it run and move and he could do things with his face that the human can. So it, it looks pretty astonishing. Mm -hmm.